It's Thursday, March 24th, 2022. My name is Ashton Ellett. I'm here with the first installment of the Richard B. Russell Foundation Oral History Project, produced by the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies at the University of Georgia. I'm joined today in Scottsdale, Arizona, by Dr. William Gray Potter. Dr. Potter was university librarian and associate provost at the University of Georgia from 1989 until 2014. Prior to moving to Athens, he was associate dean of libraries for technical services, automation, and systems at Arizona State University in Tempe. Dr. Potter also worked in various capacities at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign before that. He earned his bachelor's in English from Southern Illinois University Edwardsville in his MA and MS and PhD from U of I. Today, he and I will be discussing his experiences working with the Richard B. Russell Foundation as an ex officio trustee member during his 25-year tenure in Athens. Dr. Potter, thank you very much for, thank you very much. for having uh, Robert and me here at your home in, in Scottsdale. North Scottsdale, I guess, technically. North, North Scottsdale. I know, <laughs> this is our first time in the valley, and we're, we, we saw it from north to south, and uh, we traversed traffic in the morning here is really something. <laughs> I'm sure it, is. It, it it gives Atlanta a run for its money. <laughs> it can, yeah. But but no, it, it's very good to be here, and we're excited to talk to you. Um, so I wonder if we could start. Tell tell me a little bit about your your childhood, your upbringing. You were born in Minnesota, but grew up in Illinois. Well, I was born in Minnesota, but um, moved to Illinois with my when when I was just six months old. So I don't remember no, much okay. about it. Um, but my uh, father was an architect. Um, from Decatur, Illinois, and my mother was uh, from O'Fallon, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned to you earlier, they met yeah. when during World War II when she was a secretary at Scott Air Force Base and he was in gas school with the Army Air Corps. Um, and uh, I was born in 1950, grew up uh, almost entirely in Belleville, Illinois, which is uh, just outside St. Louis. Mm -hmm. The Metro East for the, the uninitiated. Um, not much, much of my childhood. I do have three sisters. I was the second, second in uh, in line, and um, went to Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville because I could c commute. There. Okay, I was I was going to ask why why you why you chose to stick close to home. It makes sense. Well, at the time I was in a band, and we oh, thought we could. Uh, let's but let's back up. <laughs> Tell me about this band. I was in a band in high school that was, uh, as most guys my age were in band yeah, in right. high school. And we thought we had a, possibly had a future, so we, some of us, uh, stayed around, went to school at Edwardsville so we could keep playing, and I kind of petered out after a while. But of course, the other big reason to be in college at the time was uh, the draft. Sure. So... Um, but you would have been 18 in 1968, so that, right. that, this, this checks out. <laughs> that's right, and uh, then the lottery happened in 69. I drew a high number, so I could kind of... Do you remember what your number was? 262. I think everybody of that generation knows <laughs> what, right. their, what their number was. So, um, but I was at Edwardsville, and I wouldn't say I was a really serious student, but I, I majored in English mm. and did well and decided to um, attempt a career in academe mm -hmm. and got a fellowship at University of Illinois in English where I taught freshman rhetoric and found I hated it. I couldn't teaching stand- Teaching or English rhetoric? Teaching. <laughs> well, actually grading papers. I couldn't stand grading ah, papers. Ah, yes. And um, especially all these kids from Cook County who thought they knew everything already. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I, what I found I did enjoy was working, doing library work, so I transferred to the library school. And I think I got my degree in uh, library science in 75 and hung around enough to get my master's in English as well. Mm -hmm. But I think 75 was the, was the high point in terms of the number of librarians produced okay. in, uh, in the United States. <laughs> Hmm. and was fortunate to get a job at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater, which was a branch campus of the University of Wisconsin. Right. Um, sort of halfway between 
Milwaukee and Madison to, okay. the, so yeah. to the southeast in uh, Walworth County and was fortunate that uh, the library director there, his name is Don Tolliver, who was from Louisville, Illinois, <laughs> and his wife was from Olney. <laughs> the home of the white squirrel. That's exactly right. And I knew Olney well because my father was an architect and he designed all the schools in Olney. So. Okay. So, uh, but I was fortunate, uh, Dr. Tolliver hired me and um, they took an interest in me. And then three years in, a position to open up at the University of Illinois, and I moved and I went there uh, okay. as the assistant to the director of technical services, and then eventually became acquisitions librarian, and moved up through several positions there. What did technical services mean and look oh. like back in the seventies? In the seventies would have been well acquisitions and ca acquisitions and cataloging, buying the books and cataloging the books. Okay. That's the main thing. Uh, technical services in Illinois also included all the all the um, area studies. The Illinois had huge um, uh, special language collections, Slavic, right. uh, Asian. They was, Illinois was, a, was the, at that time, might still be the largest uh, publicly, publicly supported university library in the country. Hmm. Uh, actually only smaller than Harvard and Yale. Interesting. And Explains the library school. Yeah. Well, the library, and it was one of the oldest library schools in the country, um, but anyway, I I was I became head of acquisitions at Illinois, and through some strange merging and reconfiguring, I ended up being the head of acquisitions and circulation, <laughs> which is an odd an odd combination. But the uh, the director there was a man named Hugh Atkinson, who was just a brilliant librarian. Um, he died in 87, but he um, really instilled in me an appreciation for cooperation among libraries, academic libraries in a state, mm. that you could, being the largest library in the state especially, you could benefit all the citizens by working with the other libraries in the state. And from a pragmatic standpoint, that came back to benefit you as, as well because it, it helped build your political base. Sure. Uh, with the, um, he, he could, when he needed something, he can get the pub, all the public libraries in the state to Especially rally in a state it. like Illinois, where oh, yeah. you, you need a broad base of support. Right, and uh, he, was, he was just really a, he was from, a, he was from Chicago, I think. Um, he used to, um, I had a colleague from Heron, mm. named Becky Lanzini, Oh, the Lanzinis. Uh, she was married. She, her name was Thomas, I think, but she married a guy named, from Heron named Lanzini. Lanzinis are still there. Oh, yeah. Um, but he used to kid us about how we didn't wear, uh, we hadn't worn shoes until we went to college. <laughs> and that we met our spouses by picking up coal on the IC Illinois Central tracks. Uh. Was a big, uh, <laughs> there was a Cook County uh, uh, yeah. down, <laughs> bias toward downstate. <laughs> um, but yeah, Hugh was... Uh, Amazing librarian, I, and I worked directly for Michael Gorman, who was the uh, head of technical services, and uh, British. I don't know if you've heard of Gorman no, or not. No, no. Gorman wrote the um, Anglo-American Cataloging Rules, second edition. Okay. Um, and had taught. It was actually teaching when I was in library school. Was teaching there for a year, and then was hired back to be head of technical services when Atkinson came. And then he hired me to be his, his assistant. And I worked there from uh, 78 to 85 when I was hired at um, Arizona State as um, head of technical services and then they added a systems component to that. And Arizona State was a very interesting uh, institution at the time. It was nowhere near the size it is now, it's like, God. Oh, it's a massive. It's it's amazing what uh, the current president, Michael Crow, has done to the place. But then it was a little more, it was sort of seen as a stepchild to University of Arizona. Sure, sure. Although the joke of the time was that in the 1890s, they had to decide where to put the, um, they had to decide where to put the mental hospital. And it went to Phoenix. And in compensation, they gave Tucson the university. <laughs> Uh, 
<laughs> but I think you know, now the University of Arizona is certainly still a fine institution, mm -hmm. but their ASU has kind of eclipsed it, I think. And mm -hmm. uh, back then, though, it was wasn't as um, as huge as it is now. About thirty or thirty-five thousand students, I think. At that was point. it a was it a, a? I know the answer is yes, but what was the change in culture like from from going going from Urbana Champaign to to Tempe, Arizona? Um, I wouldn't. Uh, it, there's so many Midwestern transplants out here. Oh, okay. I don't think there was a lot of cultural shift. Okay. And it involved uh, the institution was different, and it was very aspirational. That sure. they were on to do things to really build it up, whereas Illinois never felt that they had that much to prove. Sure. Um, but it was a. Uh, a very dynamic and very growing institution. We were adding, we add positions at ASU every year and had a huge um, construction project. Lots lots of branch libraries being built. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was just an interesting place. And I was there for four years, um, very formative years in terms of um, automation. So much was changing then. In terms of? Cataloging, the, you know, the online catalogs were really just coming into their own, but more importantly, offering things other than bibliographic data. We we actually um, were one of the first to put up an online encyclopedia. Mm. Uh, I think we we managed to get Grolier's in in electronic form and put that up. And the system we used was uh, Carl which was, came out of the Colorado Alliance of Research Libraries. Okay. And Carl was pioneering a product called Uncover at the time, which was, there was, this was actually Becky Lanzini doing this. Uh, they actually uh, were scanning the table of contents of, of journals and putting them up. And um, we were offering that. So it was, it was an interesting time. But I was there for four years, and then I started looking to move just because that's what you did if you wanted to sure, if you want to be move promoted, up, you had to yeah. move out. <laughs> And I applied at uh, Georgia in 89 and um, was fortunate to get offered the position. And um, one of the factors in that, I think, was that the Vice President for Academic Affairs at the time, um, William Percasi, had been the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Illinois and knew Hugh Atkinson very well. And uh, even though Atkinson has pass, had passed away, Right. Uh, he had a lot of admiration for Atkinson. And actually, of the four finalists, there was me and then there was someone else from Illinois, uh, one of the associate directors at Illinois was also in the pool. And I was uh, fortunate to, to, uh, to get offered the position. Oddly enough, um, my predecessor, Dave Bishop, mm -hmm. had gone to Illinois to be the director when, <laughs> when Atkinson died. Um, and Dave... David I didn't went, know that about... about Bishop. I didn't know he went to Illinois. He, went to, he was there for five years and then went to be director at Northwestern. Um, well done. Yeah. Well, I, I think I going to Northwestern were you, was a were step you down. Were you familiar <laughs> with him uh, before from libraries or, or anything I just, like that? Not really. I knew he looked like George Jones. That was about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in all fairness, many men in Georgia do look like George Jones. So. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, I don't remember where he was from originally, but he, there was a, I'm not sure how much of the history of University of Georgia Library you, you know, but do you know there was a huge upheaval there in the 70s? Um, was it Bose? Yeah, when Bose was director. Cheryl's told me some well, they, obliquely he started, about this. You know, the, the thing that really kind of, he was just kind of an autocratic. He came from Syracuse, right? Yep. yep. And his big innovation was to start hiring um, uh, non-librarians with subject degrees to be subject specialists. And that didn't sit well with the librarians or with the profession. And he got in, if you go back and look at Library Journal from that time, you'll see stories about it. Hmm. And it, there was just kind of a upheaval. There were other things as well, but that sort of set him off. And they brought in a study committee to look at his management and included on that study committee was Dave Bishop, who was uh, at that time at the University of Chicago as a head of tech services, I think. And 
their recommendation was <laughs> to get rid of bishops, <laughs> get rid of bows, I mean. <laughs> and, and David got, eventually got the job. Although there was an interim year in there where um, Ralph McCoy, mm -hmm. who had been the retired, was the retired director from SIU Carbondale. Morris Library. That's right. Came and was the, uh, he was the director for a year. And really, McCoy was just a, such an even-tempered, sweet guy that he kind of calmed the waters and made things uh, safe for um, the next director to come in. Hmm. But even when I came, there was still a culture of distrust of the administration that held over because it was those, the 70s was such a turbulent time. Sure. And I'm Cheryl, Cheryl lived through that, so she knows. Yeah. Uh, Susan Morris can tell you about it too, but um, it was just there was just a lot of upheaval. Right. Now it was mentioned in some of the press, you know, red and black, when you were hired, that it was really about your proficiency with systems and automation. What was one of the main reasons you were brought in? Was that was that made clear that 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 the libraries at the university wanted to move in, in that direction, or yeah. it needed to move in that direction? Yeah, as I recall, Percasi <clears throat> was keen on that, wanted to see it happen. Although I, part of that was whoever was writing the press release was, was trying to play that up because <laughs> I did have that background. I was, sure. At the time I was editor of um, information, information Technology and Libraries. I was the president of LIDA, okay. which used to be a division of ALA. I'm not sure if it's even around anymore. I think they merged with LAMA or something. Um, these are not, you both archivists, you don't know we're, the library. Yeah, 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 we're historians and archivists, so I, I'll, I'll nod. <laughs> well, it was, I was president of a division within ALA uh, that specifies in, that specialized in library automation. And I edited the major journal. It was an ALA publication, Information Technology and Libraries. It used to be called the Journal of Library Automation. I was the editor of that. And I think that's where Sort of that expectation came up was I was active in those areas. Plus, I had been instrumental in putting up the online catalog at Illinois. Right. And because you remember that, Atkinson was a real pioneer in library automation, both in terms of um, what he did at Illinois and in creating a, a statewide automated system. He was also instrumental in OCLC. Okay. Because he'd been at Ohio, he was the director at Ohio State before he came to Illinois. And um, I think that he, he, he was just known as being a real pioneer. There's, a, there's an award, ALA has an award, the Hugh Atkinson Memorial Award, mm -hmm. given to people who are prominent in technology Okay. Um, to this day. And I, 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 I received it like 2001, I think. Um, but yeah, so there was an expectation I would do something with, with computers, automation. And Georgia, when I came, had its own system. Uh, developed, oh God, growing out of what Bose did, and then David worked on it as well. It was Galen. You mentioned Galen a while ago. And it was an IBM mainframe-based system that was um, very specific. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you mean specific? Uh, it, was, it was not transportable, let's put it that way. It, was, <laughs> it was, uh, took a lot of maintenance to right. keep it going. I uh, had some very extra... Not very, built for the long haul. <laughs> right. <laughs> and fortunately, we got a, there was a good staff of programmers running it. Um, UCNS, the computer, was in the University Computing Networking Service operation, took a real interest in it and supported it. And we, when I first got there, we... Um, we looked to see if we wanted to switch to another system and decided the time wasn't right, so we just stayed with it. And didn't change until Galileo, actually. Which was 95? 94, 94, 94, 95. And that was, well, there were stages of that. But uh, I'll get to that in a minute, because I think that's really... Yeah, I was, I was gonna I, I was gonna ask next. I was like, because I can remember the very early days of the, the, the internet. Um, yeah, I would have been in grade school around this time that you're talking about, and, I, and my parents were at SIU Carbondale um, in the forestry department. And I can remember uh, Gopher mm -hmm. and, and 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 those early Mosaic, the early um, internet. Um, what what was what did University of Georgia have 
in, in, in regard to the internet and how did the well, when I libraries came, do it, you know, in 89, 90, 91, when you're nothing, talking about nothing. Nothing at the time. Well, that was, that was, that was early days then. Yeah, the sure, that was, was even a, earlier days. Um, and, you know, Mosaic came out of Illinois. Yes. Where, um, yeah. What's his face? What was, what's his name? <laughs> um, uh, well, anyway, Mark something, rather. Anyway, he was, he was at the University of Illinois and developed Mosaic. And I would, I, I, my recollection is that the library was more interested in that, in the Internet and Mosaic, than, the, than UCNS was at the time. <laughs> Um, and as UCNS, is that the precursor it, to EITS? Yes. Okay, yeah. okay. I thought so. I just wanted to be clear. And But I say you, you, they were very supportive of us. One thing we did we, was modded, modded local databases. Hmm. Um, we put up, uh, I think we put up Science Citation Index and uh, Social Science Citation Index. We put up um, Biosis. Mm -hmm. And mounted some other databases on the main on, on a mainframe that was available to anybody on campus. Now it was just the abstracts, of course. It wasn't full text uh, for the for the, but it was still a, a big, oh, yeah. big thing to do. You could go to the second floor and find what you need, or well, science library, I guess. But I mean, to actually be able to look at at biological abstracts online from your own computer, from a campus computer, that was uh, phenomenal at the time. Nobody had anything like that. Hmm. And, of course, there were no online journals at that point, even in the sciences. It was all driven by, uh, by, by print collections. And I would say the, the biggest problem facing Georgia when I got there in 89 was space. Space. Um, we were growing about 100,000 volumes a year. And this is, again, before you guys, you, you're historians, you're not librarians. So. But um, at that point, as it had been for 30 or 40 years, academic libraries were judged by how big their collection was and just the sheer number of volumes. And I forget where we ranked. Well, we were adding about 100,000 volumes a year. That's a lot. <laughs> which was 10,000 linear feet of shelving. And I, sorry, I don't, I used to have these numbers in my fingertips. <laughs> I could divide number of volumes that get square footage, but I can't right now. But it was a lot. It was certainly yeah. more than we could accommodate. Sure. So the, my big priority with, with the administration when I was hired, and remember that uh, Perkazi had just been there a year when I was hired. And this would have been Charles Knapp who was And Knapp president. had just been there since, it, since it had just been there two years when I was right, hired. Right, because Henry, Henry uh, King, King Stanford was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I hadn't thought about him for a while, but yeah, he was, he, he was a character. Uh, but yeah, so they were, it was a brand new administration there. And so the time him, for change is, is ripe. That's <laughs> right. So I told them going in that with the big thing we needed was space. We needed space for collections, and we were not able to seat um, all the students we were. We so should, student usage yeah. as well, those public I mean, they were, they were, they were, they were. SACS, the Southern Association of Colleges mm -hmm. and Schools, mm -hmm. which accredited the university, right. um, had already pointed out that we didn't have enough seating. That was the main thing in the, in, in the accreditation right. report. And I, I pointed that out to him as well, that we needed more seats. <laughs> and I've made that one of the, that and funding for, the, for journals was really the top priorities when I negotiated to, uh, to get hired there. None would have taken much negotiation. I wanted the job, so <laughs> <laughs> the topics of discussion, anyway. Right. Uh, but they said that they would they would do something about about space. And I, I want to follow this thread because I think it'll get us to, to Russell. Um, Carry and us away. So early on in my tenure there, um, I gave the president and the vice president of academic affairs a tour of our of the facilities. Um, along with Eric Matthews, I mean, you know, oh, yeah, Eric. yeah, yeah. Eric and I took him on a tour. Of the, Eric so just re-retired, re-retired during the, the pandemic. Well, and I will say up front that I was just a figurehead. Eric was the real director of the library. <laughs> <laughs> Eric knew everything. The, pa the power behind the throne. <laughs> right. um, anyway, we gave them a tour, 
it must have been in probably 90. And they agreed that we needed space and put us on the campus list. I forget how the procedure worked back then for getting a building through the ranks of I'm campus sure it priorities. was equally Byzantine as it is now. Yeah, it actually might have been more. <laughs> um, because back th there was no, uh, I don't think there was a regents priority list. The campus, oh. they, I think every year would just be kind of a free for all. I think I don't. Know I mean that that sounds, that sounds Whereas, very very when, accurate. Later on, it became very, very regularized. There was a, a campus list, and then there would be a, a regents list, and things would kind of move up in an orderly fashion. Sure. Like the special collection would. Right, took a long time. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> um, they agreed that we needed space and put a. Just put. A new campus library on the on the campus priority list, and it was like second or third on the list. And for the next five years, it was always second or third on the list. <laughs> it never moved up. And then when um, when uh, the proceed when the I don't remember exactly when this was when the procedure changed and the campuses were told they needed to put forward their top priority. Uh, I, was remember, I remember this very clearly, it was a, a meeting of the president's cabinet, which I sat on. Right. Uh, which is odd, that it was me, but not the deans. I never quite understood that, but it was the yeah. vice presidents and me, and a few, and the other. We I guess called, associate provost has the we were VP called associate rank, provost, I guess. Yeah. Oh. In fact, at that time I sat on dean's council, but uh, huh. not, not for long. Um, and at this cabinet meeting, it must have been in 94, 95, the um, president said that the top priority had to be a, a, a new classroom building. And I usually sat in the corner and kept quiet, but he actually turned to me and apologized. He said, I know we need a library, but this, this, we've got to get this classroom built. And I said, well, our biggest need is, is seating, and you're going to have a hard time, you're going to have a problem with accreditation if we don't get the seat. Plus, the students are not being served, which is a real point. Right, right. And I said, I think there are, we could do something with building a new, putting library space in this classroom building with electronic support, not have to put much of a collection in, but by putting electronic support in. And uh, he liked the idea. He thought it was uh, really good and asked me to write a memo. So I wrote a memo to him and Dr. Percassi, um laying out that we could get, if we can get 2,500 seats in this classroom building, uh, we could piggyback on the funding they're supposed to get for that. And then that would take care of our seating needs. And then for collection needs, I proposed building a special collections building for the Russell Library and the Hargett Library. And I believe I said, I think we put media in from the beginning mm -hmm. uh, for, because of the Peabody archives. Right. And they went for that and said, okay. And they agreed, but said that I would have to raise some portion of the special collections building privately. Um, and so we kind of took a two track yeah. approach then. And the, Classroom building became the Student Learning Center. Right. Now the Miller we, Learning Center. Which was the, stu the student, the name Student Learning Center was always a placeholder because we always thought, well, we'll come up with a better name than that. The, the, it was, the, when, I got, when I got to UGA in 2008, it was the SLC, Student Learning Center. But we, uh, that got fast-tracked. That became one of the top priorities for the campus. That moved pretty quick for such a it large did. That's I, project. I, yeah, yeah, Relatively I, quick, I suppose. I looked today to see if I may have that memo on a on a drift drive, but I don't. Uh, oh, I, I, I missed the point. I'm sorry. I'm no. to do this on it. When they said they would put us on the campus list for a new class, for a new mm -hmm. library building back in 1991, they said, in the interim, we'll build a storage facility for you. And that's the repo that's out the on repo. College Station, Barnett Shoals. And, you know, we talked at that point, well, maybe we could go with what was called, then called the Harvard model with the high density shelving like we now have in the sure. basement of the student learning, of the special collections building. But 
that just seemed out of reach. And instead, I, I was, my wife and I used to drive up to Belleville. She was also from Belleville, I should say. She, we met in high school in driver's ed. Um, were you Belleville East or Belleville West? East. Okay. First, actually, we were the first class at East. Okay. So we actually were the, it was interesting, we were the, we were the junior and senior, we, we went there as juniors and we were the senior class because there was, they kept the seniors at West. Okay. So they wouldn't split the class, but they split up. Sure. But anyway, we used to drive up to Belleville to see our, our parents and our families. And we stopped in Carbondale to look at a building they just built, which was very much like the repo. Mm -hmm. uh, just a, a metal building with um, the uh, sort of uh, decked shelving. Right. Although originally we built the repo, we didn't have decked shelving. We just, we just had these rolling ladders we used to get up. <laughs> and then they, we decked it later. Um, but that was supposed to give us some growing, some breathing space. So we, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned we had the repo. Um, but moving back to when the Student Learning Center was proposed, um, you're right, that got fast-tracked, and then the Special Collections Library got put onto the campus priority list because of that, by that point, uh, Stephen Porch had become the chancellor, mm -hmm. and Zell was the governor, and... Um, Porch really regularized the capital projects procedure. And so the Special Collections Building got put on the campus list. It was probably seventh or eighth. Right. But we knew that over time it would move up. Um, but we also knew we had to raise some money for it. And um, the Student Learning Center was built, opened in 2003. Mm -hmm. Uh, opened a month after the fire, <laughs> which we had. So a busy year for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we were fortunate, though. Right? We, had the, we actually had the Student Learning Center waiting when we had to close the main library for several months after the fire. We had the Student Learning Center we could open for so students had a place to go. Um, so that took care of our seating needs. And we ended up, we, so we, got, we got the 2,500 seats we mm -hmm. needed. We had the 100 group, it was 150 group study rooms? I think it's 150. Oh, yeah, that sounds pretty close. 150, and the, um, the library library's classrooms as well as all the group study rooms and the reading room. You've got the Thomas reading room, the right. more traditional library and, space. And we went with very traditional furniture, the, mm -hmm. the Moser furniture, because we wanted to have a library, wanted to look like a library, even though there weren't many books in it, uh, which... I was fortunate the uh, the architects loved it because you know, architects love that kind of furniture. Paul Cassily, who was the uh, associate university librarian, uh, university architect, um, was a woodworker as well. He just loved the ah. furniture that, of course, you have in the reading room of the student at the, at the special collections building mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, I think you know the SLC was highly success successful, and uh, we were. I forgot how many millions, how many millions of entries we get per year in there. It's busy, but <laughs> still is <laughs> a split between half library space, half classroom space, mm -hmm. and it just uh, it worked out really well. I think in many ways influenced a lot of other buildings around the around the country, and it was really born out of a very pragmatic need for for, for study space. But it, I, I gather it still is the, stu the sort of the center. Oh, oh right. yeah, yeah. It's absolutely, especially for undergraduates, the, the sort of beating be, heart of, of you know, be, student academic life. We're coming up in 20 years next, next year. I, you know, that, that's really surprising when you say, you say that because it, it, it seems like a timeless building because it yeah. really hasn't changed much since I... Now, obviously, the technology has been upgraded right. uh, over time, but it's still a very sleek <laughs> building. It's about the technology. I was... I was we were really in an interim time there. We're, we're, you know, there was no Wi-Fi. So we, we wired that place to the hilt. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can plug uh, in anywhere. <laughs> that's right. And, and including uh, cable television, uh, you know, the, the CAT. Yeah. Um, that's everywhere in there as well. And even phone jacks. I, think, oh, a phone <laughs> I, just, got, I just don't even really notice phone jacks anymore. But they're all there. And, and then we wired the tables yep. mm -hmm. as well. And... Um, it's a copper thief's dream. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of 
A lot of fiber even then, though, I think we... Okay. The, the equipment rooms there are... I've been inside one of the equipment rooms. They're, they're amazing. So anyway, that was, but that really took care of us. And for in terms of capital projects, then left us to focus on the um, on the special collections building, right? Which we proposed right, we proposed in the mid '90s and got serious. About I think it in I the have '96 would have been that would have that makes sense. That makes sense. And so you took the. You and Cheryl, I suppose, since you both would have been in the, the foundation meeting. Tell, tell me about the early meeting, because Charles well, me, Campbell would me, have been. So I sort of think this through my, myself. We, um, okay. I was in 96. We hired Chantel Dunham, the development director, sure. in 94, I think. Um, and we hired Chantel because she had, she had no background in development work. She had a background in marketing, and um, she had what what I didn't have, and that was she did not have a shy bone in her body. <laughs> she is as much of an ex. She's probably the biggest extrovert. She's the extrovert's <laughs> extrovert, <laughs> and she's never met a stranger. She can talk to anybody, mm -hmm. and that's I felt what we needed. And that when I look back on the hires I made. The two that stand out are Chantel and Toby. I mean, the, the two uh, smartest things I ever did. Because <laughs> um, she um, she picked up the the library stuff readily, and Mary Ellen Brooks especially right. kind of took her under her wing. And Cheryl, I think she and Cheryl got along very well as well. Mm -hmm. And that she picked up. You know, we could teach her that. We could never could teach her to. Yeah, you can't approach you, people. Yeah. <laughs> And so that, that worked out very well. So we had her, and we at some point, probably in 97 or so, broached the topic with the Russell Foundation. Okay. That we were going to build a special collections library and ask them to help us with the fundraising. And you'd have to go back. You know, I took the minutes. I, all the minutes oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were, you were secretary. <laughs> But I, I don't remember all, uh, exact time and place. I remember when I got there in 89, I didn't know anything about the Russell Foundation. So you, you, you were hired on, you're like, oh, by the way. That's exactly, it's by the way. And Cheryl explained it to me and told me I was ex officio. And I think the chair at the time was, um, I think it was Jasper Dorsey. It would have been, yeah. yeah. Okay. Just that one, he, he, then he passed away. Yeah. The, the next year. And she told me that that fall I would need to go to this meeting. <laughs> Commerce Club. At the Commerce Club. And I can't, I can't remember they had me take minutes the first time or not. But, I don't think so. I don't think you were. But they told me from now on I would. And I was ex officio, but <laughs> I was not on the, I was, I was secretary, but I was not on the executive committee. Which is very much the, the driver of, of, of Russell Foundation right. policy and such. Right. So um, I used to enjoy the meetings. I used to see, uh, I mean, there was a fantastic group of people there. And they all mostly had worked for Senator Russell. Oh, yeah. Um, or worked with. Or worked yeah. with, right. And those that hadn't had worked for Talmadge. Right. And... You know that you know the Talmadge really was the one who raised the money. For oh, the absolutely, corpus. yeah. Um, although I don't think he ever came to the meetings. I, I don't remember seeing him after he he was the first chair, and after that he handed it off to Phil Landrum, who was congressman. But after after he stepped down as chair, he was the he did the first three year stint as chair, and I believe he never really. Came after. I mean, that he I, he may have showed face a few times, but no, he was not a regular attendee, as you know. But what I remember most of that first meeting was D.W. Brooks was there. <laughs> he was still alive. Oh yeah. And I don't remember if Stucky was on there or not. Um, I don't 
think Stucky was. Uh, Ru- Dean Rusk would have been. Um, Rusk didn't come. Bob Stevens. Bob oh, yeah. Stevens Bob would have. Stevens always came. Yes. He always came. He was, yeah, Congressman he was, he was Stevens was a, was a big supporter of the Russell Foundation. Right. And um, the, then Bill Jordan. Oh, yeah. Was always there. And Bill, Bill was very outspoken. Yes. We can talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then McFeely, Bill McFeely was the Russell. That's what we were going to talk about. <laughs> oh, boy. He was the Russell uh, professor at the time. Right. And not a good fit. <laughs> <laughs> great guy. Brilliant. brilliant oh, guy. the Pulitzer Just, Prize winner. Right. Um, you know, great researcher, scholar, for sure. Really, I, don't know if you ever, you really, you really I never met him, no. Mm-hmm. He, had, he, had, he had moved back to the Northeast yeah. um, by the time I came to campus. He wasn't in the department when I was there. Yeah. But uh, he, was, he was an interesting guy. So anyway, um, I was secretary, and uh, Dorsey was chair, and but just for that year, maybe yeah. two. Yeah, eighty nine uh, to ninety, and then Charles. Then, then Charles became Charles Campbell became the the, pre, the chair. And Charles was just fantastic. Mm-hmm. He was so approachable and so understanding. Um, still is. <laughs> still is, and, yeah. and managed to. I wouldn't simply say there were factions on the foundation board, but <sighs> yeah, yeah, just, it, you're right. The factions isn't the right word. It's just but that they he managed to kind of bring consensus. There are folks who wanted to emphasize different things, right? That's yeah. right. Um, but we talked to Charles ahead of time about the the need for the building, and mm-hmm. he talked it over with the executive committee, and they came up with a proposal uh, that they would raise a third. Of the private money, because at the time we thought the building would cost twenty-seven million, oh. <laughs> and so we would have to raise a third, which was nine million, and that they would do a third of the third, in return for which the building would be named for Senator Russell. Right. Which I can't remember if um, I don't remember that Knapp ever came to one of the meetings because the president is also ex officio. Right. Right. As is the chancellor. Right. And the chancellor never came. Well, I tell you about it. I think. The chancellor before Porsche might have come once. Mm. Um, and Adams did come. At, or either that or we came to Athens so he could meet with us. Right. And when that happened, it was great. Adams was in his element with those guys. Because, you know, Adams had been chief of staff to Baker. Right. To Howard Baker. Um, and so Political they, communications. That, that yeah. was his PhD. Right. Or is his PhD. He's still here. So, I mean, I... I he just didn't have the time. Where he would, he, I'm sure he would love coming to those meetings and, sure. and hobnobbing with those guys. Um, but yeah, they were very much a, a Washington um, flavor mm-hmm. to those guys. And their proposal, we named the building for Senator Russell, was fine with me, but there was a contingent of other people <laughs> who supported Hargrit and did not want to see Hargrit overshadowed by Russell. Right. And including members of people who had been related to Felix Hargret, who wanted to preserve that. So we came up with this really strange naming convention. Which we that, followed. Okay, I was hoping we would explain the, the mouthful <laughs> of well, a name. But the convention we came up with was that on one side, it would not be anything over the door, but to one side it would say Richard B. Russell li- Building, I think. Richard mm-hmm. B. Russell Building. And the other side would list the three libraries. And that seemed to satisfy enough people <laughs> <laughs> to get it move us forward. Although, I mean, even, even after the building was built, there were people upset that Senator Russell's name was not in the pediment. Um, still is not, is it? I think, I think so. Not, not to my mind, no. No. In fact, I looked it up. I, I, with the, the camera on top of the parking deck, it still works, so I can yep. look. <laughs> I, I checked this morning to make sure. <laughs> uh, so that, that was, but that $3 million really got us kicked off. And I've got to say that I think they made that commitment, and then things kind of quieted down. We kind of, we got... Uh, somewhere in there, I got Tom Watson Brown to give three million for right in, in regard term for which we named the um, media archive after his uh, father, right Walter J. Brown, who 
you probably know, was a, a chief assistant yeah. to um, to Jimmy Byrne. Right, Secretary of State. Right, and it came back came back to South Carolina and set up a whole string of uh, radio and television stations. Okay. Um, and then we got a few other odd gifts. We were kind of stalled there for a while. Um, and Russell, of course, the Russell Foundation didn't give us the three million. Yeah, it was installments. It was an installment. Well, they didn't have it. They, right, right. They, yeah, they weren't going to go into the corpus for. No, for, and for, as, for. as very wise <laughs> move not to. And, and SunTrust was, I believe, SunTrust was uh, still is managing the well, uh, truest now, but whoever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> Mergers, acquisitions, etc. But they always sent a, they always sent a group mm-hmm. pair to the meetings to talk about the the stewardship the report. The stewards. Yep. And they they came up with a plan to give us three million over a period of time. Um, although they wouldn't pull the trigger until, I don't think until the building was actually approved by the regents. It, 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 the name had to be approved, and it had to be placed on the regents. On the regents, the, those were the two um, right. considerations that had to be in place for the the handover. And somewhere in there, in two, I remember in two thousand two, we did get preliminary approval from the regents. Even though the building had not moved there to their list yet, I don't think it was on the campus list. But they gave us permission to use some of the money to um, build a model and do some preliminary planning, right? Which we did, and which is helpful for fundraising, right? <laughs> and we built this model, which and put in a case and Chantel could haul it around. <laughs> um, and have you ever seen that model? No, I've never. I've never actually seen the model. I've seen. Early mock-ups it was a much larger building than it, it yeah, is it was, today. It was based on the Pantheon. Okay. And it, was, it had a huge dome on it and then three wings, one wing for each of the libraries. And the uh, libraries were uh, very very self-contained in that, that plan. And that would have been around 2000 two that we, we got some money but then well, they'd start to f- get confusing too because I know at some point they gave, they gave us permission to hire, hire the architect so we hired right. Collins Cooper Crucy and then some New York firm as well and we went to New York me and Eric and Danny Sniff who was the campus architect went to New York to meet with the architects and start making up this plan for what the building would look like. And these New York architects had some really weird ideas. And we managed to get, <laughs> managed to get rid of them. Um, do you remember any of, the, any of these weird ideas? Something to do with Conestoga wagons. That makes no sense. <laughs> it was an, an agorist. They wanted to, they were, they were, the chief architect had this idea that with the three different libraries, what we really needed was a, a marketplace approach like the Agora uh, on the panth- on the Parthenon, um, you know, in, in a Greek in a Greek city, with uh, and he was going to plan this, and he had this idea of this, just sort of a plane, <laughs> with these three buildings popping up, that would then be joined underneath that plane, like so, an undercroft, yeah. something, something like that. Um, and that didn't go over too well, so we got rid of them, and then Collins Cooper Crucy came up with the the Pantheon approach. But the other thing we determined in that New York visit was we went to Yale and looked at their high density storage facility. Okay. And to determine the whether Benicky, is that is that the is no that this would have been that was this was their storage building which oh, was the storage okay for the it was an offsite storage facility which okay. was the based on the Harvard model with the thirty foot shelves right and we decided based on that that we could do our shelving below grade mm-hmm. for most of the manuscript collections, for all the manuscript, most of the manuscript collections and most of the book collections, but have a vault, a vault above grade for Russell and Hargert to have their own separate vaults for the really high value stuff. Sure. And that's sort of the design we went to. By doing that, we managed to cut the cost down considerably and managed to get, well, if you're, Actually, somewhere I've got plans of that uh, first design, but you had to look at it. It was it was phenomenal. That if that building had been built, uh, it would have been stunning. Um, but e- each library was really 
self-contained. Uh, very few shared spaces apart from Which the, would have been a carryover from the way it was in the right, main library. Right. And some of the donors liked that, appreciated that approach, because they, they didn't want the three identities blended together. They wanted, you know, the three separate libraries. Mm -hmm. But by going with the high-density storage, which, I, as I recall, Cheryl wasn't that thrilled with it. Cheryl was not that thrilled. She, she has since been won over by it, but she was not thrilled at no. the time. I'm, I'm surprised she told you that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, she didn't like it. And um, oh, we, we I, forget where, I think there were, um, the closest facility that had that was South Carolina, so we did take a road trip over to South Carolina so they could see it. Mm -hmm. But the South Carolina implementation wasn't as good as the Yale implementation of it. Of course, this was all designed by one by one guy named Reese. Reese Still was the designer who came up with the concept for Harvard, uh, and then designed our our storage facility. Oh, okay. And tragically died before we finished our building. Uh, he was uh, he had his world he had this World War II trainer airplane, ah, uh, um, T something or other, but he was landing. He lived in Massachusetts and was landing it somewhere in ran off the edge of the runway, flipped over, landed in a stream, a shallow stream, but the plane couldn't flipped over out. and he couldn't get out and his head was underwater. Oh my God. Uh, it's a shame, he was, he, was a, he was a really interesting guy, but he, he, was his, he, he really came up with the whole idea of that 30 foot high shelf with the picker. Um, oh and, yeah, the, the, three, the three cherry pickers. All right, so, um, But anyway, my point was that by, by taking that approach, early, early on we decided to go with the high-density shelving. We, whereas before it would have been all, all compact shelving, which would have taken much, many, oh, many more yeah. floors, much, sure. more, uh, um, have much more heavily loaded floors, and a lot more maintenance too. Sure. So, but that building, we thought we could build for $27 million when we priced it back around 2000 or so. But as we got into it further, around 2005, 2006, when they, did, they ran a cost estimate and said, no way can you build that building <laughs> Not <anymore>. for $27 <laughs> million. In fact, um, you can't build much for $27 million. <laughs> And we had to redesign it at that point to come up with the current building plan. Right. Which I think must originate from 2006 or so. Mm -hmm. And that came in with a price tag of around $36 million. We're getting That closer. was eventually <laughs> up to $45 million. Right. So by the time the building made it to the top of the region's list around 2008, 2009, um, it had a $45 million price tag on it in its current configuration. I'm sure I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, but we, in terms of working with the Russell Foundation, you know, they had their three million dollar commitment. They we just updated them every year. They kept working. They they also promised, by the way, when they when they made that three million dollar commitment, that they would make their best effort to raise additional funds. Right. Uh, and they did help us with some things there. So we uh, eventually did make it to 15 million, but we were kind of cutting it close. <laughs> um, I don't think what else with the Russell Foundation, but um, I mean, they were very supportive of us. They were also very understanding that there were other donors who were not thrilled with having Russell overshadow Hargret. We never got any grief from Tom Watson Brown or the Peabody people mm -hmm. about that. Um, they were always... They were always very happy with the idea that we were going to provide the Peabody Awards with with uh, a really good environment to store store them and make them right, accessible. Right. And the uh, when I was when I got there, well, soon after I got there, the director of the Peabody Awards uh, was Barry Sherman. Okay. Who died probably around gosh mid to late nineties, I guess. I can't remember that. Maybe two thousand, I'm not sure. For a while, he and I, he and I made a proposal that when uh, when the the art museum was in the old library building, which is now the administration building. Okay, that I was didn't, I didn't know that. 
That was a library. It was built as a library in 1906. Well, that would, that would explain why Virgil and Shakespeare and stuff. Yeah. Okay. That makes uh, sense. But <laughs> now that you say they that. They had a, when, right after they moved out into the new Georgia Museum of Art, uh, this is between presidents, I think. Because Knapp, Knapp had left and Adams hadn't arrived yet. But there was sort of a, Proposal, call for proposals what to do with that building. And Barry and I proposed we put the Peabody Awards in there. And Barry even, <laughs> Barry saying, it worked out great. We just take where it says Milton, just say Milton Burl. <laughs> Milton Burl. Uh, but that didn't, that didn't go over to it because when Adams got there, he said, no, we're gonna, it's going to be the administration building. Because at that, that point, the president's office was in the Strat. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Which is legal affairs now. Legal affairs now. The Strat. And the um, the senior vice presidents were in old college. Okay. Um, in fact, the meeting I was talking about where Knapp said that the library, that the classroom was going to be the top, was was actually in the strat. At that point, one his office was on one side, and the other side was a conference room, went front to back of the building. Um, that was. Uh, about that. Anyway, I'm kind of lost. Have I gotten off track of that? Yeah. It, it, well, I, I was wondering, you know, when we're talking about the, you were talking about fundraising and stuff, um, and, you know, obviously you had you know, uh, the Montgomery's and, and the, the, the whole Evans family and the Drapers. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what role did the, the Board of Visitors, the Library's Board of Visitors, play in fundraising, or was there any cross-pollination with the Russell Foundation effort? I think Charles Campbell Charles was, was on the Charles was, was on the was BOV. Charles was on the Board of Visitors, and I don't know if he ever chaired it. I, don't think, he ever, I think he might have. I actually think I think, I think yes. he did chair it. Maybe, maybe after he was no longer chair of the Russell, he chaired it. Right. Um, and the original chair was Craig Craig Barrow. Sure. Yeah. And. That, of course, gets into the Hargett side and the Duren side. Yeah. Um, but I never, there was never any tension between Craig and, and Russell, I don't think. Speaking of which, we just broke ground on the new Wormslow. Yeah. I'm sure, maybe Toby's told you or kept you posted. Yeah, I, I saw it in, um, in columns or something. Was, mm -hmm. that, that's interesting. It's amazing how the library sort of collects these odds and ends, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we were talking like about, the, about the Capitol Museum. Capitol Museum earlier. <laughs> But uh, oh, I, I don't, you know, the, the Board of Visitors was supposed to help us with fundraising, mm -hmm. and they did to some extent. Right. Um, but I don't know. I'd have to, you know, these are all things one time I had, had on the, well, yeah, had I mean, the forefront, who, who gave how much, and I right. can't remember exactly what the Well, I mean, were. it, it strikes, you know, you were talking about, 2006, 2007 is when, when we finally get the, the final project that you can actually show people to fundraise. And, of course, that's the beginning of the Great Recession, which I'm right. sure did not help the it fundraising. Did it, didn't. it didn't help with fundraising, but it helped with the building. Because, the cost. Yeah, because of the cost. I mean, we were, just an example, I know we, we originally budgeted all the shelving in the mm -hmm. storage, in the vault, the Potter vault. That's right. Uh, at $3 million. That is still over the the door, by the way. Good. Well, I'm going to better not change that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let Paul know you said that. <laughs> um, but we originally budgeted $3 million for that, all that shelving. And it okay. came in at 2.1. Because of the decline because in the cost of, cost of steel. steel. And I can rem and also, it was such a... Commodities, man. <laughs> it was also touched such a tight, um, a tight period for contractors at the time that was it Brassfield Gorey was the mm -hmm. contractor? Mm -hmm. I remember the the, the on-site superintendent telling me once um, that he said we're not used to building fifty million dollars for thirty million, fifty million dollars for thirty million, which was was the actual construction cost. And it was a forty-five million dollar project, but the actual construction cost is probably around thirty. Okay, and the rest being materials, planning, et cetera, et cetera, architects' fees, furniture. Fees. Uh, site planning, all that stuff. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we got, even though that building is nowhere near as grand as the 
original building was going to be, um, it's still it was a bargain hmm. that we were lucky to get as much building as we got for the money we had. Right. Um, and it was because of the cost of materials was down and the contractors were so hungry for work. Um, so it was a trade-off, like you said. Yeah, it was a trade-off. And, and we did, it, it was tough when we were, I think we, we didn't close out the last couple of million until the very end with Mr. Thomas, I think. Oh, right. Uh, and that was a bequest. <laughs> so. Yeah, Sydney, uh, Sydney, Sydney Samuel, Samuel Thomas, yeah. the, uh, the rotunda. Right. But unfortunately, we're you know, we hear, really we, interesting guy. I did a little background read. It's like, who, who is this gentleman? <laughs> was, yeah, he was an interesting. Guy. He was a librarian. So. Yeah, I, mean, I guess he just invested or squirreled was, away his money. And he was very interested in investing and, and had a talent for it. Yeah. Um, and he had a house in Five Points, which he gave us, so that helped too. <laughs> that, that, so. that would certainly help. <laughs> but. Um, I think we, you know, it was kind of a, the, the big gifts from from the Russell Foundation and from Tom Watson Brown that gave us the credibility. But it, right. it was it was, was a slog gifts. going on after that because we had picking things up at, in smaller chunks uh, as we went. Um, yeah, Cheryl mentioned that she and Chantel would do the road show yeah. trying to. Name, name this gallery and that gallery and right. you know, this window case and that window oh, case. Oh, yeah, and then we also, we would use the, we had naming opportunities in the Student Learning Center, which we used as well. Mm. Uh, although there, there we had to put, we really needed to put the money into the Student Learning Center. But Right. Uh, and I just, you mentioned Evans. I'm trying to draw a blank, blank on Evans. I, the... The whole Evans family, the where, where I pulled that from was the um, remarks you gave at the groundbreaking for the building in 2010. Oh. Okay. It was just part of the, the list of yeah. folks who... I'm not sure if I can look at that, but I, I just... I'm sure I can pull it up and look, yeah, too, well, but... And somewhere there's there's a list of donors. Oh, absolutely. how much they gave. But we actually, you know, we ended, actually ended up... Um, we had to have the money in hand. <laughs> But we didn't have to spend it all. Okay. So we actually ended up with some money left over. And is that what the building fund? fund quote yeah, the building unquote. fund. And we, I remember we set a big chunk aside for a video server for for uh, for Ruta. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, and we we hadn't spent it by the time I left because she could never identify exactly what she wanted. I'll have to ask Ruta. I'll, 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 I'll text Ruta now. later. <laughs> I think they did. I think they eventually. I think Toby told me they did come up with. Something and and turned out costing a lot less than we thought it would. That's a good uh, problem. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice. When we think about, it, we started out video serving. I mean, I mean, I guess technology caught. Like, oh God, yeah. I mean, we, there was, I remember, I, I remember the first time she showed me a streaming video. It was just phenomenal. I couldn't believe it <laughs> that she could do that, <laughs> and it was so primitive at the time. Uh, right. But now, God, we, we use it all the time. We stream everything now. Right. Um. So anyway. So the, the building fund rolled over from, which, due to the pandemic, the building fund is a little, a little low these days. But well, I bet. Yeah, be, because you know, I, th I think programming um, outside, you know, because well, the libraries could. now has some place that the outside groups can have conferences and symposia right. and things like that. And by by extension, you know, we could use some of the money we raised. We could use to remodel. The old Hargret space and the old oh, okay, Russell okay, space. because you know that was part of the project was to. So did McGill come after special collections? What well, once Russell moved out? Oh, McGill Map yes. and Government Information Library. Right, they came after. Okay, so um, that was a creation, a post SCL creation. What am I looking at? Ten point. Okay. What's that? Hey, just the the time. For, for those of for those watching, we we have a, a big faculty libraries faculty meeting coming up at eleven. Uh, we'll take an intermission at, the, okay. at that time. Um, but yeah, so you, you're talking about that because the third floor is it's a big big uh, mid century modern study space, right? Um, yeah. With the that with was the that was the... oh speaking of vault space, organic library the the organic storage, which is what used to be sort of the Georgia room. Um, on the third floor. Why is organic in Maine 
instead of in special collections. I think about why that is. Do we call it organic? We call it organic, <laughs> organic storage. Well, uh, speak, well oh, because yeah, because it's because like that's where the leather, based. wood, yeah, um, uh, oil-based paints, right. things like that. Um, All the portraits. It, because the humidity was higher there. Oh, right. We couldn't. Uh, we had a. We had a climate control environment set up in the old Harvard stacks. Okay. That was just more more controllable. But also, we couldn't put stuff into the um, into the vault because the vault was so climate controlled, it was so dry. Right. Thirty percent humidity. Right, and that would that wouldn't uh, the organic stuff wouldn't survive. And we, at Yale, they actually had set up a bay for uh, museum storage. Okay. Well, they had a, they had a separate air hand, a separate HVAC just for that. Ah. Uh, but we couldn't we couldn't do that. The cost prohibitive. So that's why we left it over there. And there wasn't that much of it. But so wood stuff, oil paintings, um, we had to leave there. Or what else is there? Well, when, when the when the music Georgia Music Hall of Fame. <laughs> Okay. Speaking of collecting things, um, lots of guitars <laughs> over yeah. there. Um, yeah, lot, lots of wood, war memorabilia, mementos, portraits in the, in the well, anteroom there, is still the... What's his name's hat? The, the Admiral. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I can't think of his name. Yeah. Uh, Cal, something Kel. Yeah. Um, Anyway, his he had a, we had his beaver hat. <laughs> had to stay there. Some taxidermy. Um, he'd, he'd been with he'd been with Perry at the opening of Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, but tax yeah taxidermy. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that that it was just because we could we could keep it we could keep the humidity right. a little higher there. It was still climate controlled. Um, and of course we we had big ideas for the third floor. And then uh, we inherited the. Uh, press when Moorhead when Jerry Moorhead became the provost okay he decided that the press ought to be under under the library along with the Georgia Review and hmm. at that time at that point they were housed um, the press was on its own building out on River Road somewhere okay uh, rent a space mm-hmm. and then the Georgia Review, which I enough used to be in the library, and then we kicked them out. <laughs> we um, being you? Yeah, me. Um, <laughs> Don't want me in. <laughs> and that, uh, they were they they were were references. Now they used to. Uh, okay. Used to okay. Be. Yeah. It was because they could. Um, they had separate entrances set up there, so they could be on that. Right. I don't know what was on the other side. Anyway, when we we got some money to do some renovation in the probably as part of the. Uh, we did a complete renovation of the I remember, heating and cooling. I remember the renovations. Well, this was... This oh, was I, I remember the, the first floor. See, the, the administrative suite used to be on the first floor. Okay. Right below where it is now. Okay. So as you came in, you'd turn right, and there were... It was horrible. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I remember in 08, it was very much a 1965 aesthetic right. <laughs> downstairs. Well, you couldn't believe the, the green shag carpeting they had in the oh my God. administrative suite. Um, <laughs> it's horrible. Top of the line, wall to wall. That's right. But we, we just didn't. I didn't want the administrative suite to be on the on that in that prime space on the first floor. So we moved it to the second right. floor. And I forget what was up there. I mean, but, Gov, Gov Docs is right in front. Well, right. whether it was. Uh, right. It was. Oh. <laughs> but we. Um, we moved up to the second floor and managed to get the George Review relocated so we could turn that space into the reference office. Reference back then was, um, oh, downward circulation is, I think. Okay. So I don't remember. Eric would remember. But. We should definitely interview Eric. Yeah, you definitely. It'd be. We should have done a joint interview. That would have been too much fun. Well, that would have been. You never, never get finished. <laughs> but uh, well, anyway, we we inherited the press, and 
Was Lisa with the press when, no, when that merger came? No, it was a British woman. I can't think of her name. Lisa being another fine Southern Illinois. That's right. <laughs> Probably. But, uh, Jerry, all, the president also decided that I should, not only should be report to me, should also be in the library. So when we got the special collections building, he told me, bring the press in. <laughs> so we, I, I think I might've gotten some funding to, from somewhere else to do their renovation of their okay. space. But then the press came into that, that, that used to be Harvard Stacks. Yeah, right. And then um, we moved the review up to the seventh floor. Right. Where uh, art and music, the art and music bibliographers used to be. Right. And that. DLG's on the seventh floor too. Right, that used to be, that was where media was. Right. So we moved, we moved, um, media went over to the new special collections mm -hmm. library and we renovated that space then for um, for the for the DLG, right? Mm -hmm. And who's got that office? Who's got the Brutus old office? Uh, maybe Sheila. It's got that beautiful. It might be it's Sheila. Got that window I don't. Know. I've never been in Sheila's office. Oh, I gotta go look. It's, um, it's got a great view. I've been to DLG. I've been over there, but I've never been in Sheila's office. So DLG was on the fourth floor. Oh wow. Which was at one As point, a historian, I'm very familiar with 4th floor. That's where E and F is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, 4th floor of the old building. Mm -hmm. And when um, it had been uh, occupied by the... the Well, Hargard had, had storage there, and then the, <clears throat> the newspaper project was... Oh, fourth floor is where there's a big group study room right. where you write on the wall. I've never right. been in there because I was a grad. There? I was a graduate student. It was always full of undergrads, and yeah. I was like, yeah. And I had my own office in Lacan Hall, so it's like, yeah, that, yeah. You know. We uh, that was a good the renovation. Of the fourth floor was was fun. It's. I mean, it is always full. So I mean, yeah. that's a sign of its its and success. We decided then we'd go. That's when we started looking at modular furniture rather than the classic. Uh, Wood furniture, but yeah, so it's, it's always full, and we made the wall, set it up mm -hmm. so all the walls could be written on. In the first floor of the library, I don't know if you've been back to see it. One, um, Mr. Benson, Ed Benson, and his wife Robin donated a whole bunch of uh, funds to renovate the first floor for group study, much like uh, MLC on the first right. floor with group study rooms. Benson you, did that. You, you, you yep. So yep. How old yep. yep. Um, Ed, he passed away. Uh, April 2018, a very, very healthy, vigorous guy, had a fall, hit his head, hmm. and, and passed away. Um, but yeah, he was a big supporter of the, the library's renovation. I think the, it's, it's like the student plaza or something like that. It's where the, the Einstein bagels is now. All right, so, okay. So, so well, yeah. we, we, we put that. We put that um, completely renovated uh, magazines and, and, and everything like that. Because there, there was a lot of a lot of renovation done as part of the fire recovery too. And that was oh three. Yeah, it took us. That, that was that was when the uh, was it a homeless uh, unhoused individual? Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yes. <laughs> and he got yeah he started and got acquitted. Really. Yeah. And he was tried for it, and then I don't know why the jury, I never knew and understood why the jury found him innocent, or found him not guilty, I should say. But, were, yeah. were there no cameras at the time? No cameras, and um, really no no real security. We didn't check IDs. Still don't. Oh, we still don't. Yeah. Not, in May, not in May. Well, you, right. you can you can come to the, the galleries without an ID check. Right. Obviously, you need to check in at the the. the Research desk. Yeah. But yeah, it's still that way. Yeah, you know, after the fire, the President Adams sort of insisting that we have some patrols. Have some <laughs> patrols. And I, I managed to persuade him to know that the cameras would be enough. So we, that's where we put all the cameras in. But yeah, I was, uh, you know, I really wanted the library to be open to the mm. community. I didn't want it closed off like that. Um, and of course, the MLC is wide open too. You know, it's, oh, yeah. Yep. No. We talked about it sort of briefly, um, the sort of um, style or aesthetic of the of the special collections library, which is 
very warm wood, mid-century mm-hmm. modern look. What, whose idea was that? Was did that come from the the designer? Did of was special there, collections? Yeah, was there input for? Well, let's talk about the the, the, the sort of area of you because know, you were taking three departments that had mm-hmm. had their own spaces um, for years and years and years um, and putting them together. How was that accomplished, and how did how were you able to bring the three departments together? Um, into sort of a more or less shared workspace? Well, I think the, um, I would say it was a carrot and stick, but the carrot was far more important than the stick. The carrot was, you're going to get this new space. You're going to get (laughs) growth space, you're going to get great exhibit space, you're going to get great, much better workspace. Right. Um, Russell actually, well, Russell was, workspace for Russell was pretty bad. (laughs) I think you were down the The, sub-basement. The sub-basement? Yeah. um, Public spaces weren't, well, were too bad, but, but it's... It was very dated. I can, yeah. remember, I can remember old Russell, so that, 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 that sort but of ages me. it's a huge me. improvement over what they had. And the same with um, Hargret and Media was never a hard sell there because they, they, really, they didn't really have anything. So... They, and they were the youngest of the, right. the, the special collections departments. And, and Linda Todich, who was the director before Ruta, um, both Linda and Ruta were very appreciative and understanding and, and wanted to see the thing grow and uh, saw this was the best way to go about it. Hargit I never um, never had any issues with and, and I, I think with Russell I, th- I think um, Cheryl going to watch this? <laughs> Obviously Cheryl being Cheryl and I think she would appreciate me saying this actually she was going to fight for her area no matter what. And that's to be expected and admired. Um, and she just wanted to make sure she got that they got their due. Mm-hmm. Um, and she did. I think they ended up coming out very well. She got that separate reading room because she pushed for it. Right? Uh, and she, so I, I think it was just the attraction of having this separate building. Plus, now the carrot was with the when back when we had that first design. It was an even bigger carrot. So <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, and once they buy into that, there's no turning back. Really, they had to had to go with that. So, I didn't think it was really a never really a hard sell to get them to to go into this. Now, getting them to cooperate once they got there, they I always thought that would be more organic. That would sort of take care of itself once they actually got in the building. And um, I. Don't know if that's the case or not. I, I left after I was in 2014, so that was like three years after we moved in. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't, maybe I was being oblivious at the time, <laughs> I didn't see any big problems developing. Um, and everybody seemed relatively happy. I think the, the um, let's see, the one thing I wasn't counting on was that by bringing them all together, there was more potential for conflict, just kind of the fact mm-hmm. that they were just rubbing each other. Just the, the issue of proximity. Right. Yeah. And there's always, there was, it's very interesting, there's always been this issue that Cheryl does a fantastic job finding people, finding good people. And then they end up going somewhere else in the library. <laughs> I think that's always rubbed her the wrong way. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, you, mentioned a, you mentioned a stick. Oh, which is, you have no choice? Yeah, basically, yeah. What are they going to do? Um, I mean, <laughs> Stay Cheryl's, in the basement? <laughs> say, I, mean, I guess Cheryl's trump card would have been to get the, turn the Russell Foundation against me, but I don't think she could have done that. And she wouldn't have done that. That's not what you, right. that's like her. Right. I think as long as, my, you guys know her very well, you can agree or disagree. I think what she may, wanted more than anything else is to be able to make her case and be listened to. And I hope I never had which a is tell. The jo- which is the job of a director. Right. So, you know. um, and I always did listen to her. And she got her way when she had a good argument. And um, I would also say I don't think you know, Mary Ellen was. Um, it's a very different personality. Mary Ellen was not as not as directly assertive, but she could get still get her way if she wanted to. So. 
And they say Ruta was just fine. I don't think there was any issue there. But as far as um, the common look, mm -hmm. the, the exhibit spaces were all were done by by Gallagher. Um, mm -hmm. and Ter what's Terry's last name? I can't think of his name. Yeah. Healy. So, and, but they all ended up with, with what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And I pretty much left that alone. I, I mm -hmm. figured it was up to them. Right. The, um, the share in the auditorium was, that just made sense. I originally all had their own auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, I think media had like three view three large viewing rooms. Well, I know they have three design. viewing rooms. Well, actually, like, these yeah. actually were like the, the, the large, ten anything. or twelve, ten or fifteen seats, I think, in each. Oh wow, yeah, that would. Well, have been. I remember, I remember before you go, I'll, I'll show you the plans. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't know. Maybe just hindsight, it just doesn't. The, the The fact that we had this building, which I think, I don't know of any other university has got a building like that. Um, I mean, you could look at what Chapel Hill ended up with, where they had to end up having a fire watch because <laughs> the, the, the Smith Library was didn't wasn't sprinkled, and um, I don't know what they've if they ever done anything over there, you know. But I don't know. I mean, they do. It's a, it's a big building, but it's not climate controlled as well. You're right. And yeah, I'm trying to think in the SEC, maybe Florida, but I, I haven't been down to not Florida. For special collections, huh? Um, I know Kentucky, no. No, and no, I, I, well, I can't think of any. Right. I mean, so you can compare it, look at the Beinecke, maybe. Or, uh, that's, that's a very good peer to be compared to. No, but I, I can't think of any place else that's got a special collection. Now, you know, our original plan or our hope was to put it where the Rust Center is. Right. That okay. So, so in, just adjacent. And I think that would have been a big. Plus, having it next to the main library and having it on the north yeah. campus would have made you could it better where it is. Now. Because then it would have been more integrated. I know when they they did a huge remodel of the Arizona State Library, mm. like a $100 million project. And they kept all the special collections in the building. And the idea was they wanted to see it integrated with, um, more integrated with, with the other library functions. Mm -hmm. And... I think it's it's a really good argument to make, and but I don't think we had a choice. We, well, right, you know, because it came down to I think the site where there was that site we were looking at, and then there was a site on Lake Herrick. Right, right, it was we way out about. there. Yeah, which would have maybe tied in with a little bit with uh, the art museum and the fine arts complex. But where we are, I think, is better than that. It's, it's certainly more centrally yeah. located. And with Terry there now, it's not like you're isolated. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, because have you seen the, the new business school complex? I've have seen you been back pictures since? of it. I've not. It's, it's, it's impressive. It's, it's a very impressive are they, are they Are they using any of the... They used to use our facility for receptions and things. But I guess no, they, they have their own. They have their own stuff now. Not, not that we're hurting for, for, for people to use the... Uh, it's always busy. Always oh, that's good. Busy. Yeah, that's good. Um, oh, I mean... It's starting to get busy again, is what I should say, yeah. from the pandemic. But in terms of, you know, the reason we put the classrooms in there was to try to get the faculty to integrate the material mm -hmm. into their Yeah, and learning. faculty fellows program is still right. going strong. So, so and, but, Jill, and Jill oversees, uh, oversees that program. But now. then the, the office furniture and the reading room furniture, that I, I pretty much just mandated that would be the Moser. Right, stuff and, uh, and that's just because of the experience with with MLC right. and and I, I to make it look like a library. <laughs> that's right. I like the way it looked. There you go. So, you worked with Charles Campbell, who is the the chair of the Russell Foundation for seventeen years, and then Dink Dink Neesmith, who had been the the first chair of the foundation, who who did not work for or was a contemporary of Senator Russell. Uh, what was your experience working with with um, Chairman Neesmith. Um, he was. I have to remember because it was uh, such a short time, mm -hmm. but it was a it was a critical period when the when the building was actually starting right. to go up and right. Um, and he was very interested in it, 
and would uh, come over and we'd walk him through the we'd walk him through the building as it was being built. And he was a he was different from Charles, and that Charles was. Let me say this. Charles was very soft-spoken and very clear on what he wanted done. And Dink had a little more bombast to him, I think, as a, as a journalist. Hail fellow well met, yeah. kind of. Yeah. But he, and, and he was you know, he was a he was a publisher, and he, he mm -hmm. wrote. He had those columns he wrote too mm -hmm. for his newspapers. Oh, he's, he's still those newspapers still around. He still oh yeah he still has the newspapers. I think they just restarted one out in Oglethorpe, like the Oglethorpe Echo or <laughs> some such. Well, but he was you know, again. I come back to all all these guys were very bright, personable people. Um, the the whole Russell Foundation group. I, I can't think of anybody who was a pain in the butt. <laughs> Bill Jordan, possibly, but, but Bill was a nice guy too. He was, he was just he just had very strong feelings on right, something. right. He 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 seems to, and obviously, I never I never met the gentleman, but it oh, seems he, he must be gone by now. From course, yes, um, from correspondence and and and, and the minutes, um, he had a very, um, uh, how to say this, he had a very specific view of what Senator Russell's legacy should be and what were worthy programs. Um, yes. To fund, um, which but, didn't always mesh well with the rest of the foundation, but but Dink, um, he was. I would say there wasn't much new to do with him. Mm -hmm. Things were kind of on track with the building, and there wasn't anything he could do to come and say, "Well, let's do this instead of that." Was he wasn't about to do that. Um, I think the. The only conflict we had in there was the the name of the building. They, so some people wanted the right. the Russell name on the pediment, and he was trying to mediate that mm -hmm. because you know we, we had agreed years ago that to that schematic I'd done, which showed the the Russell name on one side and the names of the three libraries on the other, and the the committee had agreed to that, the board had agreed to that, and they wanted to uh, some people wanted to revisit and um, I think there were some bad feelings coming out of that but I mean, it didn't really I, I came up with that we came up with that extremely convoluted language for how to refer to the building which I hated Richard Everybody, B. Russell building comma special collections library yes and I hated that everybody hated it it's a but, mouthful yeah, but we were trying, to, and and I, you know, what we, we all all thought was eventually it'll just fade away and be called the Russell Building or Russell Library, or just Special Collections. And I think Special sure Collections is probably the the, the most yeah. common shorthand. This right. is if you're talking about the area, the building, because right. it can it could it can get a little confusing if you're talking about the Russell Library, uh, you know, Robert right. and I, Cheryl, or the Russell Library, the building with all three of the departments. So. But that was, and that was, when I say we had to mediate, that was not mediating between the library staff. It was mediating between donor groups. Right, right. Um, Which is a whole other um, right. task and skill set. Yeah. <laughs> or impossible to build it. <laughs> but again, and, and when Charles was, uh, Charles understood it very well. And tried to help, and tried to help, and I think Dick understood it. We were just mm -hmm. trying to mediate it. And when that was pretty much a when did Dink when was Dink the chair? I don't remember that. Dink would have been chair twenty two thousand seven to ten or thirteen. I don't know if he served okay. three. I don't know if he served three years or six years. I think he served six years, and then. Norman Underwood came in 2013, 2014. The Dink's, Dink's still on the on the oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, um, and and so so's Judge Underwood, but he's a uh, emeritus member now. But Who's the chair now? Hugh Peterson the third, so Hugh Peterson oh, wow. Jr.'s son. And is Jr. still alive? Yeah, oh, yep, okay. still still going. So's uh, Mrs. Peterson. 
They, they yeah. split their time between Ailey and Atlanta. Oh, that's nice. So, and they're very, he's still very active in the he's foundation. He's a very sweet man. Still, yep. That, that's been my, my impression anyway. So, so you know, you, you begin to, to wind down your, your professional career at UGA 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. Did you have any sort of transition plan for your successor? Obviously, you didn't know who it was going to be. Right. Um, it turned out to be Toby, Dr. Graham. Um, did you, did you, uh, leave him with any words of wisdom <laughs> with, with regard to the foundation and, and, and special collections and things like that? Well, he, him having been head of Hargret as well as That's right. deputy, uh, he didn't really need much schooling there. He was, um, I, I don't know that this ever really caused any tension between him and Cheryl or not, but because he was also deputy, he, he was much more involved in the planning of the building. Um, by that, I mean the, the financial dealings, financial sure. aspects, because he needed to know all that in case something happened to me. Um, the proverbial bus. Right. <laughs> so, but so I, not, I didn't have to really leave him much in right. that regard. He knew what was going on. And what I had left him was for him to sort out how he wanted to organize things once I once I left. I was, but as far as the transition, I, um, you know, I, I chaired the search committee for the provost. Actually, I chaired it four times. Really? You didn't know that? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I knew that you had chaired the one for the most re which would have been. Uh, yeah. I chaired it when. Um, was it Witten or was it Witten. when it was? Yeah. But I chaired the one that hired Jerry and Arnett and Karen Holbrook. Okay. Uh, back in whenever that would have been that Holbrook was hired. So you're the one to credit slash blame, depending on your <laughs> perspective. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it was, uh, I think I, w I was sort of a safe choice because I was sort of at the dean level. And the librarian reports to the provost, not the president. Right. Um, was at the dean level, but I didn't have a teaching faculty contingent to <laughs> worry about. Yeah, and I uh, I chaired it f with we hired Holbrook and then Arnett and uh, actually it was interesting when we the the one that hired Arnett or, or recommended Arnett I should say um, Jerry was on that committee. He would have been law school. At that or point, honors college. Yeah, I, think he was, I don't remember now. It might have been honors at that point. But he, he, Jerry was very active in um, faculty governance, mm -hmm. and but I remember him coming up to me after after I did a, after the first meeting we had of the search committee. He came up to me and told me that was the best run search committee he'd ever attended. And thereafter, he always, the next two when he became president, he wanted me to chair the. Chair the search committee for for Witten for the hired Witten. Then I shouldn't say hire; they recommended. Um, you did a great job. Here's some more work. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I don't. I don't. I don't know. She's still. She's not. She's not UGA anymore. She's not. Who's that? Witten. No, she is she, the president of Indiana University. Yeah. At Indiana, I thought she went to Kennesaw. She did, and then from Kennesaw to Indiana University. That's right. She was in Holbrook. Went to um, Ohio State. No. From That's a Big Ten. Yeah. Pipeline and uh, Arnett just retired, right. so that's interesting. But I would, um, of all of them, I think Witten had the least. What was that? Uh, email. Oh, okay. Of all of them, I think Witten had the least understanding of libraries. That was. <laughs> well, 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 what did that mean? Because in some ways that would be a downside, but it seems like it could also be an upside for for you to to explain oh, no. things in your way. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> No, because uh, I remember the first time I first budget meeting I had with her, I had to explain why journals were going up. She just wouldn't but wouldn't believe it. But it uh, just wouldn't believe the price tag for them. She wouldn't believe it, and um, and I here I, I chaired a search committee, <laughs> and fortunately, um, Jerry was then president, and Jerry did understand it. Jerry, um, you know, I, I would say of the vice presidents I worked for, Percasi was by far the best. He was. The most solid, most understanding of libraries. Mm. But he'd been dean of arts and sciences in Illinois. He was he was very well. And the only problem was he was a behavioral psychiatrist, psychologist. 
So I always felt he was running us through a maze. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, B.F. Skinner and his his pigeons. But he was great. But then, but Jerry was also very really good, and Jerry was very supportive of the library. And he was the only one I ever worked who ever worked with me. Well, I shouldn't say that. Um, Perkazi actually was was uh, on the board of uh, the Center for Research Libraries. Hmm. So and he, used, he used to, he and I used to go to those meetings together. But Jerry was the only one who ever would go to like he went to a, an ASERL committee with me once. They wanted a they wanted a provost to come talk to him, and he was the only one who would agree to it. Huh. And uh, that was, you know, it was very everybody was really impressed with him that he would that he would come and talk to him. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he was Jerry. Jerry was and is good. I I, um, I assume he's going to be around for a while. So let's, so far so good. Yeah. But. Uh, I lost train. No, 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 no. no. Question, but yeah, you, it was the, the you know the biggest issue facing any, any library director is training the administration, training your boss, and is that same as the president presidential level? Even though you don't report to the president, uh, indirectly you try to do it, but it's really the provost mm -hmm. you have to work with, and sometimes you can do it, and sometimes you can't, and uh, that's life, I suppose. I'm sorry? That's life, I suppose. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, with, as far as it was about my transition, when I, I knew I was going to go, actually, I had anou I announced it. I wanted to announce it about the time that the search committee for the provost was underway. And Jerry asked me to wait until it was over. But he did, but during the interviews where he brought them to campus, he told me I could tell, he told me I should tell them, old mm, candidates, that I, I would be leaving. And I remember telling Telling Pam that, and she asked me, "Do you have someone? Do you have someone picked out?" <laughs> and I said, "No." But I do have a very good deputy, and uh, I would hope that he would be given a fair shot at it. Um, so I thought Toby had a really good chance to get it, and it turns out he did. Um, and he certainly would have been my pick. And, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we were lucky to get him, lucky to still have him. So, it's mm -hmm. so you know, you, you had decided to wind down your, your career. Um, you know, Athens has been named the number one place to retire in America, yet you're here, you're, you're back out here in the <laughs> desert. What, what, what drew you back out west? Um, well, I, when I worked here in the late 80s, my wife and I just really loved it out here. Mm -hmm. And we lived, oh, about 10 or 15 miles south of here in a place, an area called McCormick Ranch in Scottsdale, which is very different from here because it's all green. Oh, oh. planted. Yeah, that leaf, is very different. Lots of grass, lots of eucalyptus trees. Um, and we liked it fine, but we used to come up here occasionally. Like we'd go to the boulders, which was about, if you were driving north, if you mm -hmm. noticed those big big rocks ahead of us, not the yeah. mountain, but the big, that's where the boulders resort is. We used to go up there for dinner, for lunch and dinner. And then there was a place about two or three miles south of here that would, we would go for um, for lunch and dinner sometimes. And we just loved it up here. We loved the natural desert and always wanted to come back to this area and uh, always assumed we would. That's that's why we did. Hmm. Um, Athens was, was great, but um, I like it here. <laughs> what do you miss most about Athens, Georgia? Oh, the people, I think. Just uh, in the springs. I miss the, <laughs> this time of year is a great time to be in Athens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I would say the, it was the people and that's, that, that, that would say it, it says it all, I think. Right. Well, so. anything else you'd like to record for posterity? Well, did you want to talk about Galileo at all? Or you? Oh, oh, absolutely. I, that's right. We had talked about it at lunch. Yeah, we had talked about Galileo and Digital Library of Georgia. You know, the, one of the, the whole reasons you were brought in was to you know upgrade and develop the, the digital and online capabilities of the libraries. Right. And, and it feels like Galileo is something that's always been there because mm -hmm. it's 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 been integrated so well, you know, forwards and backwards. Um, what did it actually take to do that, and, and what did you have in mind, and has it lived up to that? Well. When um, 
when I got there in 89 and started meeting with Rackle, which is the, the library directors from the system. Okay. Regents Academic Committee on Libraries. Right. And we started talking about cooperative programs and we start, started talking early on about um, cooperative acquisition of, of databases and possibly going with a shared system for a shared library system and other sort of pipe dreams that we could do. <laughs> but we just saw no hope of any money to do it. And quite honestly, nobody was going to pony up money from their own budgets to tax ourselves to do it. And I would also say tech was totally uncooperative. You know, was, Georgia Tech? Oh, yeah. They, um, they wanted to do things their way. Didn't they pull out of Galileo? <laughs> Couple of years ago, I think they're back in. Oh, but we'll have to. We'll have to. Did the point? Anyway, I remember I, I, that was after my time. If they did, oh, oh, it would have been very. It would have been 2018, well, I mean, 2019. I was always surprised that Catherine did some of the things she did. But anyway, um, when um, when Zell got elected and brought in Stephen Porch as chancellor, they wanted to find some projects that would benefit all 35 campuses and we saw that as our as our shot uh, they had the lottery money and they were willing to spend a lot back then they could spend lottery money on any number of things right and so we put in a pitch that they fund some cooperative efforts among the libraries of the university system of georgia and as i mentioned to you at lunch um, we were assigned a liaison with the system office, which was uh, J.B. Matthews, who is the head of computing for all of the university system. No, re no relation to Eric. No relation. To okay. Eric. I think he was he was one T, not two Ts. I think. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> and he his he had somebody working for him named Jane Williams, um, whose husband also happened to be the uh, head of computing at Georgia Southern, hmm. so he would actually come along to a lot of meetings to kind of advise us as well. Sure. And we started talking about things we could do. And um, they are back. <laughs> yeah. Well, very good. Uh, so we started about things we could do. And cooperative acquisition of databases was one. Going with a shared library system was another. Uh, and it, expediting interlibrary loan and lending both for books and journal articles was another. And um, that included subsidizing library delivery, finding some way to pay for the moving the books around. Right, right. And then there was also a digital library function, you know, scanning and making available rare materials throughout the state. Um, and we kind of prioritized those. I think sharing the databases was number one, and because um, that could be done quickly. And going with a shared library system was in there, was close to the top. And we sort of pitched that to them. And then, as I mentioned to you at lunch, I was driving up with my wife to see um, our families up in, in Illinois. And I called back in the office. This is back before you had email. <laughs> or email that you could dial into that one easily. And this would have been 91, 92, I guess. Okay. And uh, my secretary, Mona, said that Jane had been trying to reach me. So I called her and she said she needed a proposal like tonight on, on uh, <clears throat> sort of laying it out. So the only computer I had with me was a little Hewlett Packard palm top. And I, when my wife was shopping at some uh, mall in Eddyville, Kentucky, I, I went to a coffee shop or something and, and typed up this proposal. Um, and went to, there was a trailer nearby that a developer owned that had a fax machine. I'm not sure how I did it, I, I, but there was a way to link my palm top to the fax machine and send a fax. I don't even know. Well, I, how did you talk your way into a real estate developer's trailer? They, 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 were kind of slow, they were kind of slow, so <laughs> <laughs> they let me do it. And got that to Jane, and Jane and Merrill, who I'm sure you know Merrill, Pencil. I don't, no. Really? No. Well, Meryl was the head of Galileo. For, she, she was the, at that time, was the director at Columbus State. 
Okay. And actually came to work at the at UGA as head of public services for a while, hmm. and then became the head of Galileo. And gosh, I don't know. Two thousand, two thousand one, probably that hmm. range. Um, but anyway, they they took it and worked it into a formal proposal and got it in. And Porch liked it, and he took he took it to the governor. The governor liked it, and so. I forget the actual mechanism they had to go through to get this. Sure. But, hell, if the chancellor and the governor want it, it, it was Who's done. to stop them, right? Right. And so we got, we got funding in a, on a recurring basis for it. Um, and, again, started out with the, we then went through process of selecting what databases we wanted, and I think we partnered with EBSCO to offer. Right. I think there wasn't as much that available back then. There were a lot more abstract services than there were um, sure. text. Sure, your American history and life, so right. something like that. So, and, and for, you know, there were all things that we had, but easily two-thirds of the other schools didn't. And so it was a big, big plus. And then the, the interlibrary loan part kicked off quickly, and we got the funding to... Pay a, um, I think. Well, well, first of all, we, we got high speed scanners for every every library. Yeah, they were these were they were primitive, but they were big flat bed scanners where you could scan articles quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, but with internet connections, we could send them all around the state. And then the uh, courier service we worked that out. And that's Gill Express. Right, Gill Express. And then we started working the big. What took longer was Gill itself. Because we, we first we had to choose a system, and then we ended up with um, what did they call it back then? No, not Notice. It came out of it was based on Notice out of Northwestern. Um, gosh, I can't remember what the name of it was mm. now. What the? But it was a commercial system we managed to buy, and it, and it turns out to be the one that almost everybody uses now. Oh, okay, I didn't know it was a proprietary um, system. It, it was. It, it, it just took a long time to work out out and where where the servers were, and it had to be there were some politics involved because, of course, we had to have a server and I think Tech and Georgia State had to have servers too. So, um, and Tech was kind of well, Tech was well, they dragged their feet on a lot of it. Well, because the director dragged her feet, I should say. That was uh, Miriam Drake. Um, and. But we eventually got that up and running, and then around around 2000, maybe 99, 2000, I, I started pushing to get the DLG, the mm -hmm. Digital Library Georgia portion, funded. And I think I seeded that with, I paid for the director position myself. Mm. And then with the thought being that we could if, I could, if I could find the position, provide the office space, get a couple positions out of Galileo, and then um, get some funding for equipment. We could get something going and, and start writing grants, which is what and we which hired, is what we do now. Yeah. We hired the guy. The guy's name was Stephen Miller. That's the guy who was in the car crash with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> for the for those not at lunch, it's a very cryptic statement. Right. <laughs> but yeah, we we we'd been at a Rockle meeting and we were driving back and I fell asleep. I was taking some kind of medication for my. Uh, Injured knee or something. Ah. But anyway, um, <clears throat> he left. I forget where he went, but then we hired Toby to be the head of the Digital Library of Georgia. And right. that's sort of, it started going from there. And it's pretty much self supporting now, I believe. I mean, we, we pay for between Galileo funding and, and grant money. It right, right, itself. right. And uh, I, I guess Sheila's still running. Sh it. Sheila is. Speaking of one of the folks who, who was at Russell and is now at his right. another part of the library. Now, when you were developing Galileo, um, yeah, I was in college in Missouri um, in the early 2000s, and we had something called Mobius and Merlin, which mm -hmm. was a similar system. Was there a statewide system you were modeling Galileo off, or did, did you have to build this from? The... I would say the other way around. Most of these other systems were modeled on Galileo. We, Jane and Merrill and I probably talked, gave talks in two-thirds of the states hmm. about it. Um, I know I can remember going to um, <clears throat> Texas and giving a talk at TLA about it. And um, the director from UT 
got him and said, we, we can't let Georgia get ahead of us on this. <laughs> and so they, they set something up, and I gave a talk at uh, well, NC Live out of North Carolina. It was pretty much based on Galileo. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was an effort from the State Library. Um, and I, 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 I need to mention that you know, we, did, we did include the public libraries in, in Galileo sure. as well. Um, and I can remember going to talk to their statewide groups and they were so suspicious they thought they thought I was trying to, they thought it was after something I don't know <laughs> do you think is that just a, a cultural difference between public libraries and academic libraries I think it, I think it, or it also because the, the library services construction act provides money to law for libraries in every state mm -hmm. which goes to the state library and the state library apportions it now in Illinois that money was was given to academic libraries as well as publics, and Georgia have always been just to the public. So I think they thought I was trying to get in on that money somehow, <laughs> which I wasn't. But um, they, but they came around. And I, I think they benefit from Galileo access. I mean, and, and the schools. Some of the schools were the most appreciative of anybody. The K through twelve. The oh, fact yeah. that we provided that, and I guess it's still out there. Well, and I, I was a lot of DLG. I, I don't know enough about DLG to speak authoritatively, but so much of what they do put online uh, is, is geared towards K through 12 mm -hmm. education and meeting the Georgia standards and everything of that nature. And then the, the databases are still mm -hmm. available. To, uh, I think, you know, we've kind of, I need to go back. I have not looked at Galileo for a while. I, I gather that the number of databases has shrunk a bit. Yes, yeah. But, um, but there's still... Compared to what we what they now had. It, it shrunk quite a bit in two thousand eight two thousand nine mm -hmm. I think I read it was upwards right. of thousands that you had to cut subscriptions to. Um, but I I would assume those were clawed yeah. back with with increased funding. Yeah, I, I, to I some know. degree. I don't know. That worked. And as a historian, there were a very limited number of databases I, I used. <laughs> so. The science library folks would probably be more more educated. But in terms of what K through twelve needed and and what the public libraries mm. wanted or needed, and what we, we liked was the idea that people were being exposed to Galileo from when the from you know their first day of school actually. So uh, I'm not sure if anybody's ever studied that to see if I don't know. Know. I don't know. Who came up with the name? Well, I was about to say that it was Ralph Russell. Ralph was the the director at um, Georgia State, and I would say the, the driving forces would have been Ralph and me and um, Merrill, and then Charles Beard, who was the director of West Georgia, mm. who's died. I must have died ten years ago. Okay, longer than that. Um, and then, of course, uh, Jane Williams and J.B. Matthews. Mm -hmm. From the center part, and George Gomond at uh, Valdosta, um, which has the library school, yeah. in, in in Georgia, yeah, which was a real feather in his cap. And uh, George and I went to library school together, so, was, oh. but yeah, he was um, he had to f he had to fend off an attempt to move it to the University of Georgia at the end, I, not be, not by me, but by other people who wanted to see it up at UGA. But uh, that, that's been a real boon for us because we can train our own libraries. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 uh, so, I mean, that's, you know, when, when I think about, you know, how the library's changed and everything, uh, yeah, Dewey Decimal System to Library of Congress, card catalogs to, to, to online and Galileo. Um, you you sort of see your career was <laughs> very much served in a, a transition period from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, when I started, it was all car catalogs, and um, the first big automation project I was involved with was in Wisconsin. We were going to do a, uh, what was it called? It was a microfiche catalog. We were going to do a, a union catalog for the whole system on microfiche. Microfiche. And update it, update it every month. Um, which just seems silly to me. <laughs> I remember. Yes, writing, it made sense at the time. <laughs> well, it, it made sense to some vice chancellor uh, for the system. <laughs> or, 
and he got really mad at me for that. I, I said it wasn't going to work, and uh, that we were going to be investing in online catalogs. This was, would have been in 80, I'm sorry, 77. Um, but online catalogs really was the only way to go. It just took a while to get there, and gosh, it seemed like such a big accomplishment at the time when we pulled it up at Illinois, and when was it? Gosh. 82, really. <laughs> um, we, we had, Illinois had a, a short record on like Alley. We just brief author title and date. But we wanted to put a full record in. Right. And we managed to do that. It seemed like such a huge accomplishment. And now I think that's so well, relatively you know, trivial. In, in, to, in context, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, you're a victim of your own success. <laughs> right. Um, but, but you're right, that was, the car catalog was such a huge, huge cost to manage. And then the, just the physical space to house 100,000 additional volumes every year. And now that's, I don't know what UGA adds, probably around 30 or 35. Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, probably, probably we can ask there. Nan. Nan would know. But I'm mean, sure there's still still an issue, but it's not nowhere near what it was. Right. And if you start weeding out the, if you start taking out the science journals that are available online now, you could probably and put those in cold storage. It just saves you so much space. Mm -hmm. And I know, but I think Tech didn't they put almost their entire print collection over in that share facility there with Emory? I, I, I they do have they moved a lot to the yeah. share facility, yeah. um, which I'm sure. Opened up space for growth, so or, or, or 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 public public space. I'm not sure how they're using it. What always annoyed me about that was they never talked to us about about joining them on that. And uh, I guess they figured that we were so far away. No. Benefit of the doubt. Okay. No, <laughs> it wasn't that. It was. Uh, it was. I, I would say it was just a tech mindset, and uh, and then they, and they saw it as an Atlanta collaborator, but they didn't talk to Georgia State either. Mm. Um, so they, they did this thing just between the two of them and we would have uh, you know I, it, it reminded me of a project we I proposed back in before Galileo where I wanted to put in these high speed scanners in each of the four libraries Emory Tech Georgia and, and Georgia State and to guarantee people that we could fax something to it within, within, within 24 hours. Because the, among the four of us, we had a really strong collection, ours being the best. We, we had the best journal collection there was. And Mimi just would not hear of it. I don't know why she just would not hear of it mm -hmm. at, 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 at Georgia Tech. And then we, um, the other thing that always galled me was that we did enter into collaborative purchase agreements for the four of us with um, Elsevier and Wiley. And the way those agreements worked out was if any library had a subscription, all the libraries have a subscription as long as we didn't cancel anything. And that gave us electronic, it was when electronic access was first coming up. So it meant tech got access to all the Elsevier titles we, we subscribed to. But we had to continue paying what we paid. Tech continued to pay what they paid but we we got access to the same journals, and then when the time came to cancel things, um, we had a bigger nut we had to work from, mm -hmm. which impacted us more. With can our cancellations hurt us more than they hurt anybody else, so it was just always kind of galled me hmm. that that um, collaboration with tech was always kind of a one way street. And I don't I thought when um, when Catherine Murray came there from uh, Colorado State. Where Colorado had a big collaborative thing through Carl that should be more cooperative with us, and she wasn't either. So it must be, I think it is just a tech mindset. And I, I think now they don't even have a librarian running it. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know who, who runs it now. In Emory, I, Yolanda Cooper, who was the director, who's now gone to, where'd she go, to Indiana? I remember now. But she actually worked for me at Illinois. <laughs> she was a clerk at, in, in the service program in Illinois. Um, but they've done something weird at Emory too. I think. Well, I, I, the only thing I know about Emory is, is special collections, yeah. um, which they did a really, 
a full overhaul because uh, special collections marble manuscript archives rare book mm-hmm. library was always up in the 10th floor the public space anyway and <laughs> I don't know if the, the, this was linked or, or there was any causality or causation. Uh, we built, we opened special collections and then they renovated their right. their space, which it's now, it's now a named library. It's the Stuart, mm-hmm. Stuart Rose Marble Library. Um, well, and they tried to get a, a special collections building. It just didn't, mm. didn't go too far. No, yeah, that, that, that may still be in the works, but it, it, yeah, it's not a reality. Well, I think their alternative was to build that that storage facility yeah. and free up space by moving stuff there. Right. Which is, I've never seen it. I assume it's the I same. have not. Se- I've only seen, I've seen some um, some videos on Twitter is the only thing I've, I've is seen. Is it the high density it. storage like the vault or is it? I, the only video I saw of it was um, sort of the, the assembly line, the conveyor, and there were, there were like oh, robots okay. picking up books out of, Big plastic. It looked more like a FedEx oh, or a... It's a robotic... A, it's one of the robotics that, facilities. At okay. least, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm sure there's a component like, of it. Like, like Chicago did. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So, makes sense, especially if tech's involved, to have, you know, mechanical engineers right. dream, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I don't... You have to talk to Toby sometime about how, yeah. how the cooperation is among the four. I don't know who the director of state is anymore. Mm. But. Well, you will be happy to know we do have new microfilm machines in the basement <laughs> <laughs> but the, Jim Cobb once told me um, they, they, there used to be the you remember the old freestanding ones that projected down on the right. flat white it was uh, they were still there they were the uh, they were the microfilm machines too beautiful for Sherman to burn <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah onward and upward yeah, microfilm Still yeah. the longest lasting of the medium, so. Well, we we have one of the biggest cl- microphone collections. It is a massive collection. Yeah. So I, I know a lot of interlibrary loan in and out um, from microfilm. Well, I mean, that was, um, you know, we've always, we were always a mass lender um, of, um, of ILL. And as, as we should be, we were. Mm-hmm. But even to places like NC and UNC and NC State, we were, which would be a surprise, I think, for, for mm-hmm. a lot of people to hear, yeah. because you know, when you think of UNC and its status as a research library, right? And NC for a while, NC State wouldn't wouldn't lend to uh, what was it? They would lend to ARL, but they wouldn't lend to the other. They would not lend to the other libraries in ASERL. <laughs> uh, it was strange. The internal politics of research libraries. Oh yeah, that's strange. Who's to know? Okay. Well, is there anything else? I, I think, I, Dr. Potter. I think that's a that's a fantastic conversation that we've had. Let me just check. My, I wrote down a couple of things. Let me see. I oh, think sure. I covered everything. Let me just check. No, I think it, I think we covered it all. Um, I know it's hard to cover a quarter century or more. I would stress that um, with the special collections library that that Adam Michael Adams was was really supportive of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, I it kind of worried me when he came in because it, we had to kind of bring him to speed. And um, were you worried was, about his background or coming from like center college? Just, just I didn't know him. Okay. And, and I think coming from a small college, it mm-hmm. worried me because I mean, well, he'd been at Pepperdine, which uh, he, he was a center, which is obviously a fantastic liberal arts right. college, um, right. but different from a tier. But he, but he had R1. been. I forget where he went to undergrad. Yeah. Um, what about Ohio State? It can, anybody can. Yeah, we can look it up. But but I I remember the first time I explained this student learning center to him. He said, "Oh, it's an undergraduate library without any books," which is exactly right. Yeah, and so he bought it. He understood it, um, and with the special collections building, he was he bought into that originally very quickly. And uh, the Russell Foundation did help me with that. Mm-hmm. They um, and bringing those guys in on it was was a big help in persuading him that it was a good good idea. So I so say he was always he was always. Uh, he was, always, he was pretty good to the library 
all along. Uh, uh, there were some years there where funding was just so tight he couldn't help us. But that would have um, been beyond any president. Right. And, but one of the big things we had to, I always had to stress with the president and the provost was that there was the materials budget and there was the operations budget and he didn't, he didn't bleed one for the other. And that was always a hard sell because you know, here I am sitting with a $10 million materials budget and they were always saying, well, why can't you just cut and not buy so many books and hire some more people or, or fire people and hire, buy my books, buy more books. And was, um, but I always thought you had to have a firewall between those two. Hmm. And uh, my understanding is Toby's got a very good provost now, someone, someone who understands what's going on. So that, that helps a lot. Well, I, I, there was something I was going to say, and it was there. And it was gone. Yeah, anyway, it must not have been that important for me to so. say. Well, Dr. Potter, thank you very much. Well, thanks for coming by. Oh, I mean, this you got a beautiful home, beautiful state. Um, we were very fortunate. Um, support from the Russell Foundation to be able to do that uh, and do this oral history about the, the history and evolution of the Russell Foundation. Well, we'll see which uh, state's more screwy <laughs> in the next few months. <laughs> well, you know, I, th I think... Um, it is uh, exciting times. <laughs> exciting times. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Sure. Thank Appreciate you. it.